David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Am Am Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. That's an important point, so pay attention to that. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, and he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her own cleanliness. Then she returned to the house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, these words have come from you. May they pass through me and into the ears of those who are here. This is my prayer. Amen. So, David, who is king, and kings go to war. That's a king's job, is to go to war. David gets lazy. I mean, David's been through a lot. At this point, I mean, he's, he's finally clear of, of trying somebody trying to kill him every week uh, because he took their place. Saul was trying to kill him. But, I mean, he's a little more relaxed at this point. His kingdom is established. The big thing is the kingdom is established. So uh, he gets a little slack because he, I think David, as, as a lot of us, when we get to a point in life, especially our career, where maybe we move up and we don't have quite as much to worry about, we get a little slack, we won't take some time off, right? From, from the, the hectic, constant battles that we have, and he's taking time off from the constant battles that he's been fighting, all the things that's happening. So David, at this point, has got lazy. There's nothing wrong with taking a day off. I'm not a good guy to take a day off. When I've got something like I do here, and I take a Sunday off, I don't relax. I worry about Sunday. So I'm not here. You see, which is why you see me here more than you don't. Because I'm that guy. I can't. I'm not a micro, my micromanager, did it? She rolled her eyes. So I guess I'm a micromanager. But anyway, I'm not sure. We'll have that conversation at once. But anyway, David is the kind of person who is constant, constant, constant. He takes a day off and he forgets who he is and he forgets his responsibility. It's more than just a day off because he has sent his entire nation of Israel to fight for his kingdom. It's his, it's his obligation to go. See, there's not really a whole lot of, there's really not a whole lot of leeway to make these decisions for himself. That's his obligation. But he chooses to stay at home and send them. Maybe he's gotten to the point where, because you know he's defeating everybody who comes up against him at this point, so maybe he's gotten a little bit overconfident. We ever been there? And have we ever been lazy? And have we ever been tired of worrying about it? And have we ever shoved it under the rug because we don't have to worry about it? You know, when you shove it under the rug, it stays under the rug. Until it crawls back out. Okay? Nothing ever stays eventually. Somebody's going to pick that rug out. They're going to find it. So you shove it under the rug instead of dealing with it. It's like when maybe when you were a kid or now. You sweep. I know that at home, my laziness is if I sweep the kitchen floor, sometimes, most of the time, I just decide not to go in there and get the, the uh, dustpan and sweep it up the dustpan and put it in the garbage can so I just leave it in the garbage can and get it later. <laughs> Am I the only one that does that? <laughs> Everybody's laughing so I don't think I do. <laughs> but it's kind of like sweeping it under the rug. You're just too lazy to get the dustpan and put it. So that's where, that's where we're going with this. Because he's in a place where he shouldn't be and that's at his, at his palace. So, in his time in his palace, with all the time on his hand, when he's not serving God like he's supposed to be. Listen to this. When he's not serving God like he's supposed to be, he's walking around on the top of his lovely, gigantic, enormous palace, which he can do, and he's walking around on the roof, and he's getting things that he shouldn't be, and he sees Bathsheba. 
but Sheba is in the bathtub. Now, ladies, you don't want anybody walking around on their roof looking at you in the bathtub. I'm sure that's not a good thing for, for us to be doing or for you. That would be happening to you. But that's where he is. And he sees Bathsheba and she's bathing. In the, in the Bible it says that after a woman has had her time, after a woman has had her time, she has to cleanse herself. It's a ritual. See, she's not just taking a Saturday night back. She's cleansing herself from a time when she has had her period. So she's really doing something here. And he falls in love with her from a distance. <coughs> and he says, I've got to have her. And he's King David. And what you've got to understand is, if King David says, I want it, he's got it. When he tells his servants, I want it, they go get it. And he said, I want her, and they went and got it. All she's getting, he's getting baby. She goes. See, he's using his, his ability, his power, and all the things that God's given him in the wrong way. He's using them wrong. He's no longer with God, working for God, representing God. Who's he representing? David. So this is the first thing he does wrong. So, when you go down to 6 and 11, you read so David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out to the king's house, the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Had he not come along from a long journey? And did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, Now this is, this is showing you the integrity of Uriah. Uriah said to David, David, The ark of Israel and Judah dwell in booths. And my Lord Jacob, jo uh, my Lord Joab, and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? You see his loyalty? You see? Here's the two differences. This is good and evil. This is the two differences. He's still doing what he's supposed to do. He's still loyal to God. He's still loyal to David. And he's still loyal to the men that are laying in the field. And he refuses to go <coughs> and to lie with his wife and spend the night. But see, David's got this all figured out. If he can get Uriah to go down there and spend the night with his wife, then she'll get pregnant and it'll be her child. This is so far stuff, ain't it? You see, this is all my children, don't you? Well, you used to. I think it's gone off the air. Church had a little day on the So, he's... He's, he's got the clock going. David's messed up. He knows he's messed up. You ever been there? You ever messed up and known it? You know that feeling you get the pity your stomach? God gave you that. Did you know that? God gave you that to use two ways. First, it's the pit of your stomach that says, don't go there. Don't do that. It's that fear, maybe. Or however you want to label it. But it's that feeling, that emotion you get, however it comes to you, that says, this ain't a good idea. You ever seen it, you know, in the cartoons, you see that little devil on one shoulder and the, the angel on the other? That's true. It really happens. The devil's in one ear and Christ is in the other. And there's a conversation going. And one said, ah, go ahead. And the other one said, don't do it. Don't do it. But you know, as people, as, as, as on this earth, as humans, we always choose to go the other direction and to, I'm good, get it, I get it. But we always choose to go the other direction because you know what? The other direction is much more fun. Yeah. I mean, really, seriously. Uh, I eat things I shouldn't eat. Look at it. I eat things I shouldn't eat, but they're so good, right? They're so good. But you know, your doctor or whoever, your wife, maybe, 
is saying, don't eat it. It's not good for you. You know you're not supposed to, but it's so good. Just do it. So that little good and evil thing. So he's plotted this out, but then he begins to dig his hole. So we go to 14 through 17. In the morning, David wrote a letter. Listen to how he gets himself in this hole even bigger. In the morning, David wrote a letter, 14 through 17, to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Is that not wrong? Sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from it. That he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. 26 through 27 reads When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. Listen to this. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And that's not <coughs> That's an obvious thing. But David now has it made. He messed up. He fixed it so it would look a different way. And he took the monkey off his back. So now David's back in the palace. She's his wife. She's going to bury him a child. Which turns out to be his son. And David is sitting back in his recliner. And he's watching television. And he's got it made. And you can't worry about one thing. So, <coughs> see how he fooled God? You see how he fooled God? He thought that God was going to be mad and all of this was going to come down on him. But David's smarter than that. So he's smart. So he fooled God. And now, he's back where he started. But with a new child and a new wife. Things could be better. Until Nathan comes. It ain't over, folks. 
Bible says that she can't sweep it under the rug. And that's what he tried to do. He messed up. David messed up. He messed up because he didn't go to war. He messed up because he didn't do what God had asked him to do. He messed up because he didn't do what he's responsible to do. He didn't act in a way that was responsible. And we all mess up that way. We all do this. We all do things in our life. Look, if you're old enough, you mess up. When children mess up, we're like their children. When adults mess up, they're like they should have known better. <laughs> and it's true. We should have known better. But we mess up. Listen, you live in this world, you live on this earth, you're going to mess up. David messed up. David, the anointed by God, king of Israel, even he messed up. If he's going to mess up, you're going to. You'd have much more opportunity, really. We mess up. This story is about messing up. This story is about doing something wrong, making a mistake, but not dealing with the mistake. That's what this story is about. This Old Testament story that very few of us ever study or ever care about or ever want to read, that's what it's about is today. It's about tomorrow morning when you mess up and Wednesday when you mess up and next weekend when you've messed up this week and you're dealing with it. And you carry it on your back. And it sometimes destroys us if it's bad enough. If it's something that we're really worried is going to come back on us, then it can just completely destroy us. People kill themselves off of other mistakes. But I say that if your spiritual health, and you'll come to learn that I'm a big advocate of spiritual health. Your doctor is all about your physical health. I'm all about your spiritual health. If you're where you need to be spiritually, inside here, you're going to be fine. Even if your physical health is bad, you're going to be fine. <laughs> David's spiritual health right here is completely on life support. But he messed up. His problem was he didn't deal with it. And, and at least, look, I've said this before. I don't know how many times I've lost count. You don't have to come to me. In some places, you have to come confess to your priest or your pastor so you can get forgiveness. That's not the way we do things. You've got a God that you can talk to any time, any day. Uh, you can talk to at 2 o'clock in the morning. You can talk to any time you want to. Drive down the road. You can talk to your God. And you can, but that's all he wants you to do. Listen, he wants you to recognize the sin. Listen to me. He wants you to recognize the sin. Even if it's only to yourself to recognize your sin is a sin. And stop covering it up. And stop trying to make it light of it. And stop trying to, to make it okay because it's not. He wants you to stop covering up and accepting your sinful nature. I'm not calling you out. I'm telling you what God wants. God's calling you. And as Christians, more so, as Christians, we know what a simple nature is. You go out here and find somebody that's completely unchurched, has no idea what we're talking about, doesn't know who God is, doesn't know who David is, and really doesn't care, and he's sinning like mad, but you know what? He doesn't realize. But the problem is that in us, we realize. Here's the good news. You don't have to live with it. All you have to do is admit it to yourself and to God. See, if you recognize sin and then you admit to God that you were wrong, you're good because God's given you something that's called redemption. He's given you forgiveness and redemption. See, you don't have to do this. You don't have to kill somebody to cover up your mistakes. You don't have to kill somebody to make that that your wife and that your, you don't have to kill anybody. You don't have to do all this stuff. All you have to do, because you, we have talked about self-righteousness in here. You cannot get righteousness yourself. Righteousness only comes from God. Righteousness only comes from God. Forgiveness and redemption also come from God. We just asked for What should David do? David do? We could, we could hold a three-week Bible study on what David should do. Seriously. Everybody's going to have a different opinion about, about how he should have done that. But the first thing he should have done was what he was supposed to do. He could have won. 
See, when you put yourself, while they say about idle hands, leads to death. That's exactly what he did, see. Idle hands don't mean that you've got to constantly be fixing something and doing something, don't sit on the recliner. What, what idle hands means is that you've left what you should be doing for God in your place with God and you've wandered over here and that's where it all happens. Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Christ, listen, in Christ we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. If you don't know what that means, through Christ Jesus, you're forgiven. That's simple. You're forgiven. But you have to ask for it. You have to acknowledge your sin. Ask for redemption. In the middle is that road. So you already messed up. Over here you messed up. Now you're sweeping. There it sits. Where it needs to be over here. Luke 21, 28 says, But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift your heads. Listen, straighten up and lift your heads because your redemption is drawing near. That means don't hang your head in shame. You don't have to. Lift your heads. Straighten it up. Look to God. You know your redemption. Many of us carry a lot of things we don't have to carry. I know you get tired of hearing me say this stuff, but I got to keep saying it because it's the truth. It's God's truth. I don't believe in preaching one thing one time one Sunday and y'all just it. <coughs> I believe in preaching it all the time because it's truth. It's truth. I preach truth. The truth I preach is in the scriptures. That's how I know it. You carry burdens, you don't have to. You carry mistakes, you don't have to. You don't have to come to me or anybody else in this room. But you do have to go to your God. And you do have to admit that. And you're going to mess up. Listen. I tell young Christians all the time that they found salvation, they're new in salvation. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect and life's going to be great. It means you're going to continue to mess up tomorrow. Now you have an idea of how to deal with it. Now you have an idea of how you don't have to carry it with you that you can actually leave it somewhere else. God wants it. Give it to Him. You don't want to leave it. He carries it so much better. You know, people always say, I say, you know, I'm really overweight. They say, yeah, but you carry it so good because you're tall. But the scale doesn't carry it as good as my height, so. But you know what I mean? God carries it so much better. He just does. So hold on to it. It's a time of Lent. We're coming to the end of the time of Lent. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. We're going to welcome Jesus in this house next Sunday. Y'all aren't going to believe it. We're going to welcome you. You're going to be a part of it. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And he's going to come down this, this aisle here. And we're going to welcome him into this house like never before. I ain't bringing a donkey. <laughs> But bring you Jesus in. It's going to be a great day. And we're going to start celebrating the Holy Week. And we're going to do some great things. I'm excited about it. Some great things are getting ready to happen. I want you prepared. That's what we've been doing for the past six weeks. Preparing ourselves. And Sunday, people, here it comes. Let's get ready. Let's get ourselves ready. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, prepare us for the coming of the Christ, for the coming of the King of glory, the coming of the King that will, will enter into our hearts and enter into our houses and enter, enter into our lives, where we will celebrate the risen Christ. And we'll do all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ in this place. Help us to prepare. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Francis is going to lead us through something they said at this afternoon. Can they help us out? I was in a ladies' meeting about a month ago, and 
The girl that does the devotions always has something spectacular. And she had a little sheet, and it says, Jesus loves me. And it's the adult version for Jesus loves me. And I think during this time of Lent and preparing for Easter, we need to sing this song and pay attention to the words. And I know you know Jesus loves me. We've all done it since we were. Yay, high. So stand and sing. 